Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my slides and hear me clearly. Thank you. So let's begin uh, with the epidemiology of melioidosis. What do we know now? So I'm going to uh, give an introduction to melioidosis because uh, I, I, I met people who have really never heard the term and have no idea what melioidosis is. For those of you who are uh, who, who know about the disease, please uh, excuse me uh, or bear with me uh, while I uh, explain to the others uh, what melioidosis is, uh, where it comes from, what it causes, and uh, what the situation in Sri Lanka is. So we know that uh, if we are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, we call all those patients as having tuberculosis. So similarly, melioidosis is the name given to all infections caused by a bacterium called Burkholderia pseudomeli. Now Burkholderia pseudomeli is a gram negative, oxidase positive, non-fermenting bacteria, basically a pseudomonas, belongs to the pseudomonas family of bacteria. And uh, like pseudomonas and many of the non-fermenters, it is a soil saprophyte and it loves to uh, live in a muddy uh, soil, and in the tropics, so you will find that the melioidosis belt uh, uh, is, is between um, 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator, along the equator, on both sides of the equator, this tropical and subtropical belt, that is where you find uh, melioidosis, and that is because a Burkholderia pseudomeli survives in tropical areas in the soil and water. So obviously, uh, who are the people who are going to get it? It will be people who have some kind of exposure to surface water. Occupational exposure to soil and water. It may be recreational, like in hikers or people who do water sports. Uh, or it may be lifestyle, like maybe all of us who live in a rural, agricultural, tropical country who have this kind of uh, exposure to surface water and mud in the tropics. And it is obviously then uh, transmitted. It's an accidental pathogen that infects you accidentally during the course of your normal day-to-day -day, uh, work. So how do we actually, how does it enter the body? Well, it's most likely, the most likely uh, route of entry to the body is inoculation inoculation, uh, either through the mucous membranes or through some kind of abrasion uh, or wound uh, in your uh, limbs, right? or ex you know, exposed wounds. Uh, but, but it is well known that the bacterium can be, uh, can, can be uh, acquired by inhalation. And for example, after severe winds or some kind of storms, uh, you get an increase in uh, Burkholderia pseudomeli or melioidosis pneumonia. So that means that the most likely uh, portal of entry at that point was inhalation into the respiratory tract. And we also have uh, in, 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 in sort of in studies found that, uh, you know, feeding to animals can also cause pseudomeli. So there is a possibility that ingestion also plays a role. And, and what we have found in our experience is that um, some people get uh, sort of uh, salivary uh, abscesses uh, survival in infantinopathy, and they, they have found a relationship to untreated water. So uh, ingestion of untreated well water in Sri Lanka could be considered a risk factor and a probable mode of entry in those cases is ingestion. So melioidosis has some um, sort of uh, unusual features which sometimes make, makes it difficult to diagnose and manage. One is the variable incubation period. Uh, it used to be dubbed the Vietnamese time bomb, because uh, soldiers who served in Vietnam would go back to their countries. And sometimes many years later, as old people, they develop melioidosis. They have never left the US maybe, but um, they, they develop this tropical disease. So most likely they uh, acquired it in Vietnam, you know, maybe decades prior to, prior to the actual uh, manifestation of their infection. So this, um, you know, the, Incubation period can be very variable, but most of the time in Sri Lanka, it's you know one to two weeks. Uh, then we also have um, variable clinical features. 
uh, which I will not deal with because uh, there's another speaker who will tell you, who will elaborate more about the clinical features, only to tell you that it can infect each and every organ of the body. I think Bhagya will tell us more about that. And it's been called the great mimicker because of that. And maybe that is why we find it difficult sometimes to diagnose biliodosis clinically and why we have been missing it perhaps in the past. And finally, it has a tendency to relapse. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, uh, previously about 13% of patients in Australia were found to relapse. So it's again, a problem of management. We have to follow up these patients and watch out for relapse and uh, the other speakers will tell you more about that. So, uh, so I told you it's a tropical disease, it's in soil and water, and all of us have exposure to uh, soil and water of the tropics. So how come we are not, we are not all having melioidosis? So the reason is that uh, uh, the uh, exposure is common, infection and disease is mostly seen in people with some kind of uh, comorbidity, underlying predispositions, especially diabetes, but any other organ disease. And in children, please remember thalassemia. Thalassemia, there is a predisposition to acquire uh, melioidosis. So uh, people have done studies about the association between diabetes and melioidosis, and they have said, you know, the, the, the relative risk is like between 7.5 to 100. Uh, that, that's larger than the, you know, relative risk of, uh, of uh, acquiring tuberculosis in diabetic patients. We know that there's an association between diabetes and uh, tuberculosis, but it's even stronger for diabetes and melioidosis. Melioidosis also shows a seasonal variation. So in the wet seasons uh, of these tropical countries, uh, it is increased. And also after severe weather events like heavy rains and winds, and after the tsunami, countries that uh, knew about melioidosis had an uptick after the tsunami where you know a large amount of uh, soil and water was uh, washed in, uh, uh, and washed uh, in, in, into the into the coast and onto people and people were inhaling and aspirating a lot of soil and water. But uh, in 2004, we did not know about melioidosis. So, uh, you know, maybe there were cases that we did not uh, identify. But certainly the severe weather events we have had in Sri Lanka too. And uh, we have seen in, um, this is a case cluster in, um, in Batiklo, and then we had a case cluster in Akrebatu uh, that were following the heavy winds and rains. So you remember a few months ago, we had some heavy winds and rains in Sri Lanka. So that's the type of, and now we're going into the monsoon. So now is the time we have to be alert and look out for melioidosis. I mean, the papers are always talking about dengue and lepto, spirosis. Certainly we have to look out for those too, but melioidosis should not be forgotten. And why not? Why should we not forget it? Because it is a potentially fatal infection. It has a very high mortality, you know, shockingly high, really. Uh, in Australia, it used to be 20%. I have to say it has improved now. To They managed to bring it down to 9% with early diagnosis, very good uh, diabetic control and ICU care. But in Thailand, I think it's still as high as 50% because they don't have a free... Um, sort of, um, they don't have a uh, free uh, health service like we have here. So when I mean, uh, Bhagya talks about the treatment, you'll understand why, uh, you know, it's a very expensive treatment and our free health service uh, is part of the reason why we are getting uh, better uh, outcomes here. So it can be reduced considerably by early diagnosis and effective therapy. I'm not going to talk about the therapy, Bhagya will tell you about it. So for the next few minutes, I'll just tell you about the history of uh, melioidosis in the world and Sri Lanka, and a little bit about what we know now about the epidemiology. So Burkholderia pseudomalli and melioidosis was first described in uh, Burma, Myanmar, um, by a pathologist there and his, uh, uh, and his assistant, Krishna. so Whitmore was the pathologist, Krishna Swami was his assistant, and they uh, found uh, um, a disease that resembled an animal disease. There's an animal disease called um, uh, called um, uh, glanders, and this was resembling glanders. Uh, and then they realized it was a completely different disease, and uh, somebody else called it melioidosis. So then after that, there were isolated reports from, say, Vietnam and Thailand and places, but very early in the piece, within uh, six years, there was a case in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Melioidosis was found in a 
the European uh, was a tea broker or something in Colombo, uh, described by the director of the uh, Medical Research Institute. It was called the Pasteur Institute at the time, which is so it was described in Ceylon. That was the name of Sri Lanka at the time, very early in the first maps of meningosis. The first map that was published showed 1966 shows, uh, you know, the place with meliodosis. But somehow it got completely forgotten or uh, unknown after the time. And it took till, I think, 1993 when uh, Shalini Pereira, microbiologist at Sri uh, Chandrapura, along with uh, Dr. Anula Vikas, who was a physician, they diagnosed a fatal case of uh, meliodosis in Sri Chandrapura Hospital. Uh, no, I think it was 2003. So. Anyway, uh, in all the maps, we are described as having sporadic meliodosis. So it was at that time that um, Professor Thermanesam, who is the Professor of Microbiology at the Faculty of Medicine uh, in Peradeniya, diagnosed two cases in 2006, uh, two cases of meliodosis uh, in the Peradeniya Hospital. And uh, she asked me to further at it, and I'll just give you a description of what happened to give an idea, because I think I'd like to inspire all the other microbiologists to take a disease you know, or physicians also, and try to look at it, try to dig deep into it. Uh, it might take some years or decades, but, you know, there, there's so many infections out there that we are, I think, underdiagnosed. So we had to do things like develop, care, you know, case definitions, do some active surveillance. We had to develop a reference laboratory with culture facilities. I mean, it's very easy to culture. Uh, antibody facilities and best of all we set up the microbiologists together the microbiologists are united in forming a sort of a network and we started looking for it and of course even in the public from the times i think of the some time there somebody did a nice graphic uh, and we we're trying to educate the public also about this uh, infection so this is just very simply to tell you what happened so after the first two cases of Meliodosis, things were very quiet for some years. In fact, I almost gave up uh, looking for it. Uh, so the first five years, there was hardly anything. Uh, and, you know, I used to always say, okay, this is a rare disease. But then as we started to learn more about it or recognize it more, and especially because of the microbiologist, I would say, uh, suddenly this um, infection, you know, it started showing up, showing up. And not in just one part of the country, but you can see, all over the country. So this is when a microbiologist takes up a post in Batiklo, and then suddenly that whole East Coast lights up with meliodosis, and then somebody goes up to the North, to, to Jaffna, microbiologist, and again, the North lights up. So it's, sometimes I say, this is not a map of meliodosis. This is a map of microbiologists, because <laughs> they kind of superimpose. So it, that went on like this, and you can see, you know, now uh, there's almost too many uh, cases. I, I don't map them anymore because they are all over the country. So it's just to sort of give you an idea that it's there in all the districts, in all the provinces, it's there in um, the wet zone and the dry zone. I think it's only the hill country uh, that is uh, sort of without uh, meliodosis. Uh, talking, so you can see, you know, it took a very long time, right? It took almost a, how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Almost a decade, decade before I got any decent results. I mean, it was all right for me. This was like a hobby, so it didn't matter. But uh, if you're young, you might be very um, sort of disheartened and give up after three or four years. So what I'm saying is, don't give up. If you try hard enough within a decade, you know you will find uh, your disease. It will be there, I'm sure. Um, right. So um, maybe I should just first show the. Oh, okay. So this is. Okay, now we'll move on to the last part, a few words on the epidemiology of meliodosis in Sri Lanka. What do we know? So we know it's uh, more, like everywhere else, it's more predominant in males, but certainly that's a good chunk of females. And don't forget, there are children as well. So if you look at the age distribution, we've had, even had a neonate and a two-year-old, and we have had a 96-year-old. So it's like across the board. Uh, you can see it in pediatric practice, in, uh, you know, in, in obstetrics, you can see it in... Um, in, in, in geriatrics, but predominantly, of course, in males at between say 40 to 60, which is of course the diabetic age group. Um, and then again, uh, if you look at the setting, it's very much a rural setting. Sri Lanka is a rural country. This is the normal, you know, um, if you go out 
well, half an hour of Colombo, this is what uh, Sri Lanka looks like. So you can see something important to note here is that one thing, everybody does cultivation, which is like this, like breathing in Sri Lanka to cultivate your own pala and things like that. And also we walk barefoot. We walk barefoot, that is our natural state. So it's just ideal conditions to acquire melioidosis that baby will get down now and start running around. And that's probably how the two-year-old acquired melioidosis. So it's not just a disease of farmers, right? Don't think of it as a disease of farmers. It's a disease of, you know, everyone in Sri Lanka. We've had all, all types, you know, from businessmen to principals of schools to, uh, you know, so white collar, blue collar laborers to, um, to farmers and surprisingly a lot of uh, three wheel drivers and motorcycle again I'm wondering whether you know the inhalation of dust um, is part of that uh, story in Sri Lanka. But the risk factors still stay uh, hold it's the diabetics who are most at risk right but don't forget there are healthy people as well. I'm not going to talk about the systems affected just to show you, you know, it's just each and every system is there. The clinicians will tell us more about that. Basically, uh, one classic, uh, I think, uh, thing to remember is that most often multiple systems are there. Pneumonia with septic arthritis, you know, that kind of combination is uncommon in other infections. So if you look at uh, 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 monsoons, there is definitely a, a corresponds to the uh, incidents and floods means, you know, the Gampa had massive floods, I think 2015 or so, and suddenly the whole thing, uh, you know, burst out, you know, we had a huge number of cases after the floods. Mortality, we are doing better than Thailand, but not as good as Australia. I'm sure we can bring this down. It's a massive mortality when you think about, you know, quarter of the patients in our database are dead. So we have to do something about it. And this symposium is also part of that. So let me conclude by saying meliodesis, I feel in Sri Lanka, it's still the tip of the iceberg, the 100 and oh, 600 patients we are diagnosing a year is, is not at all the correct number. Um, someone did, in fact, a modeling where they said South Asia is the place that we have the brunt of meliodosis. And, um, and Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is supposed to uh, build a model that Sri Lanka should have almost 2,000 cases of Melioidosis diagnosis. We are not there yet at all. I think we must be diagnosing 600 or something. So we have, a, you know, we are only diagnosed maybe a quarter of the cases out there. So as long as Sri Lanka is green and you know, verdant and full of, uh, you know, plant life and um, and we also are rural, we will continue to have melioidosis, uh, and that's how it should be. So it's really up to us to catch it early and uh, treat it early and save the lives of our patients. So thank you very much. My outline of my talk today would be a little bit of introduction on what media disease that has been done by Professor Korea. Thank you, madam. And a spectrum of disease also, I will elaborate a little. A common clinical presentation and few atypical clinical presentation that we have managed at low. So just to start with, I think what we first need to uh, just a brief look at uh, what what fastidious organism, what resistant organism this is. You know, it it can survive in variety of hostile conditions, and also it can survive in a lot of uh, evade the immune system of the body. So this is a fastidious organism that can, you know, uh, survive in many adverse conditions. Now this I will. Uh, Elaborate. I thought I will elaborate this. There are four factors a clinician should be mindful. One is the rules of uh, transmission, percutaneous, inhalation, or ingestion. These are very important in the history of a patient who is presenting with a febrile illness. The second thing that also I think Dr. Uh, Inupamkar elaborated the incubation period can be very short as well, which I will show you cases where the incubation period was ultra short. And there are extreme uh, long incubation periods in few selected cases as well. Third factor is the risk factors that we face. And diabetes, of course, is number one. And according to her, uh, statistics also, and which we will be, so you, you can see how many patients that we present are diabetes. In addition to that, chronic alcohol use, 
chronic lung disease, liver, renal disease, liver disease. So many conditions that are similar. Mm -hmm. So these are great mimickers. So if a renal disease patient presents with fever, there are many differentials for a clinician and this, is, this should be one of them. Now, this is the fourth factor that we should uh, dig, dig into the history, the exposure. Of, it, could, it could not only be uh, occupational, it could be recreational, the weather conditions, we, we are getting some monsoon, sir, and we are, so with that, we have seen the peak, the disease peaking, and some, you know, uh, unchlorinated and untreated drinking waters can also lead to meliodosis. So these are the four factors that we need to be mindful on uh, evaluating a patient with suspected meliodosis. So this is called a great mimic. Now look at this case. This is a 54-year-old patient with diabetes mellitus, CLCD. He's a carpenter. He had muddy water exposure and came with fever three days, body X, faintishness. He was uh, hemodynamically unstable on admission and he had neutrophil cysosis, high CRP, and was treated as leptospirosis, which, which was quite, from the history, it looked quite leptospirosis. Uh, he was started on fluids, vasopressors. Uh, he was moved to ICU since his blood pressure was crashing. And the blood culture came positive for uh, pseudomelae and started on meropenem, but he didn't give us time. So he succumbed on day two due to overwhelming sepsis. So this is a case of uh, meliodosis, mimicking leptospirosis, and the patient was quite septic at the time of admission and the patient succumbed. So there are many uh, similar cases that we see in practice that we need to be mindful of this disease, which is not very rare nowadays. Now, if you look at the clinical presentations, mostly they are acute, about 88% of them. Then there are a few chronic cases and few relapses, which I will elevate each and every one. So now I think it's not only the physicians that should be actually uh, be mindful. If you look at the spectrum of disease, it might present to a neurologist. It might be one of the things that might present to a cardiologist. It may be the urologist that is only dealing with the urinary tract infection, or a surgeon with multiple abscesses and you know uh, head and neck lumps with you know infected abscesses or lymph nodes. So there are so there are many presentations of meliodosis which can actually have a broad spectrum of presentation can present to any specialty. So that is a message that I want to disseminate. But of course, it is more towards adult practice and physicians. So if I, this is a, actually a culture positive uh, cases. We have, we have had uh, 72 cases which are culture positive. And um, so we, my talk will be on these, some of these cases. And I'm thankful again to the uh, microbiologist Dr. Bhagya for releasing this unpublished data for me to present. And uh, this, of course, uh, in addition to this, there have been cases where the culture is negative, the serology was positive, and I'm thankful to Dr. Bhagya for helping out with those cases, which of course the number to more or less of more than 40. So we have so for the last eight years, we have managed about 110 cases of meliodosis. These are the cases which have been uh, culture positive, and uh, I will be Taking these cases one by one, I will just, if time permits, I'll rush through all these interesting cases. First, I will go through some respiratory infections because this is the commonest presentation. This is a case, a 54 year old, like a diabetic and a, a mushroom gardener. Uh, again, there are two risk factors cough and on and off fever for two weeks. And the chest x ray had bilateral infiltrates like a multi lobe pneumonia or tuberculosis. TBPCR was negative, there was neutrophil leukocytosis, CRPSR was high. Uh, even the bowel and blood cultures were negative. Sputum had normal flora. Uh, treated empirically with Keptrax on Doxy, there was no response. And then we got the help and we got the meliodosis antibodies positive. And we started treating and the patient with the uh, intensive phase of treatment, the patient improved. So this is, of course, is a great, again, a mimicker of a multi lobe pneumonia. Uh, looked a little like tuberculosis or any other bacteria. This is a second case, again, a diabetic CKD, 
uh, is he, he was exposed to flooding and landslides, which is common in some part of the southern Sri Lanka. And again, similar picture, negative gram stain AFP, there's a left-sided lung abscess, and the blood culture through positive video. So this again is a case of a milioidosis presenting as a lung abscess. These are two extremely interesting cases, which I will, if you don't dig into the history, you will never know, right? So one patient had a road traffic accident, and during that process, he has fallen to drain. And he presented a week later with fever, right? So then uh, he had right basal pneumonia, and we would never have dreamt of milioidosis. And because of our, you know, the microbiology support, this was confirmed to be milioidosis. So this you can see is very the, how important the history is. Look at the second case, right? This patient has had a near drowning while uh, bathing in a river two weeks back and had left low low pneumonia and again a case of so the, the drowning which was actually we we would never have dreamt of has become a now one of the causes of a pneumonia in a case with uh, near drowning. So if you look at the local data as well, you can see uh, most of our, even in going in par with the international figures, we have, you know, majority of our presentations have been respiratory, that is one amounting to about 30% of our culture positive milioidosis cases for the last eight years. So lessons learned for a clinician on chest infection, consider milioidosis in a community act by pneumo patient with risk factors and risk exposure. This is a great mimic of tuberculosis and you need to be mindful in negative entry. Sometimes we might have treated as a sputum negative TB, right? And single or multiple lung abscesses, again, you need to be mindful whether this could be milioidosis. And and also interesting in cases of drowning. Second commonest presentation for us could have uh, deep-seated abscesses. We'll visit a case history. Is a, again a diabetic, 33-year-old alcoholic. He's a tsunami victim. We know tsunami uh, was one of the, as Madam said at the beginning, could have been one of the risk factors where the exposure was far disturbed though. He presented fever, chills, trichos, right hyperchondrial pain, and uh, ultrasound revealed uh, multiple liver abscesses and treated in line with the, started treating in line with the bacterial liver abscess and blood culture was negative. And this patient, again, with the help of the uh, Madam Inoka Korea, so we diagnosed mediodosis and was treated successfully. Uh, we had a pus culture was, was also positive here. This is a culture positive case where the pus of the liver aspirate had been positive. So we, we see many, uh, you know, um, other than the lung abscesses, the deep seated abscesses, there are other deep seated abscesses, many cases where the pus or blood had been positive when we, we have treated successfully most of these patients. So the lessons learned. Consider milioidosis when again the history I'm elaborating again. The history is going to be very important the risk factors, risk exposure in any septicemic illness, multiple abscesses on liver, spleen, on ultrasound, or CT. All this suspect milioidosis that you need to follow and diagnose and treat. Cardiovascular manifestations are not very common, but uh, there are very, quite interesting cases that I will elaborate. Uh, one would be, uh, I think, uh, both one of the two co authors are on the head table, Professor Yakakore and Dr. Bhagasi. You see, the first reported case of infective endocarditis uh, due to milioidosis, a 73 year old COPD ex smoker, ex alcoholic, paddy and chain cultivator, a tea plucker, admitted with uh, fever cough, there was a murmur, high ESR, high CRP. 2D echo, there were multiple vegetations attached to the aortic well with, uh, with micro and aortic regurgitation, and blood culture was positive. So it's a culture positive endocarditis due to milioidosis, which is a rare occurrence, but it's nice to know that these things do exist in certain difficult cases for clinicians. The case two, a 70 year old, again, an interesting case, 70 year old with bronchiectasis, he's a fisherman. He does a little bit of gardening, smoker, is ex-alcoholic, can be productive cough, fever and SOB, 
and he's got uh, he's got a systolic mem on examination. There were multiple lung abscesses, and his uh, transesophageal revealed aortic valve vegetation, and his uh, his bronchial valve was positive for pseudomelae, and mediated antibody was also quite significantly high, and so we treated successfully for this patient with uh, intensive treatment and rest of the follow-up was done by the microbiology team. Very interesting, another case of a mycotic aneurysm, diabetic, engaged in agricultural activities, presented with pain, fever, painful uh, right lower limb, uh, with absent pulses, CT autogram, showed a uh, large secular aneurysm, blood culture, and during the surgery, the the, the Vessel walls were sent for uh, bacteriology, and they all they both grew uh, pseudomelae, and it's a culture positive mycotic aneurysm, but there were no vegetations of the two VFO. Antibodies were positive, and the, after the vascular surgical intervention, the patient was successfully treated. So, lessons learned on cardiovascular manifestations this can be a rare cause of endocarditis and mycotic aneurysm. Consider it always in risk factors or if there, are, if there is exposure. So, neurological manifestations again a rare manifestation. This is an interesting case of a, again a 65 year old male, a diabetic farmer, alcohol consumer, who presented with uh, acute onset difficulty in walking and urinary retention. He had on and off fever for six months. He had right thigh abscess and acute taxi paralysis of the lower limbs and uh, neutrophil leukocytosis, ESR, high CRP, which we commonly see in individuals. And MRI confirmed that was a transverse myelitis. And pus culture of the thigh abscess was uh, positive for pseudomelae, and his antibody theta was very high. So uh, LP was supportive, but uh, culture there was no good. And patient was trans was, had the initial also induction therapy, intensive therapy, and then was sent to rehabilitation for where he had he had a near uh, normal recovery. This is another case of a diabetic again. So you can see diabetes is in each and every patient you get diabetes, right? So again, coming with the meningitic picture, very high neutrophil, high CRP, and uh, LP. So there is a cytoprotein dissociation and uh, was possibly thinking this was a bacterial or tuberculous was started on keptriaxone, considerogen H, ampicillin, vancomycin and acyclovir. So after three days, uh, patient was not responding, the, um, had a multidisciplinary meeting and started the anti-TB. Still, the patient was uh, response was poor. Patient deteriorated, had to be intubated for airway protection. And later on, the miliodosis came into the picture, and it was antibody. So antibodies were very high. The cultures were negative here, and responded well to miliodosis regime. So lessons learned on CNS manifestations: neurobiliodosis, always again history, respect exposure. Cases of atypical manifestations of a meningitis or poor response to conventional treatment. And it's a great mimicker of tuberculosis. If you if you are if the patient is not showing response and there is no confirmatory, always check for meliodosis antibodies or cultures as well to see whether we are whether this there is underlying meliodosis. Genturian infections are also rare. We have seen few cases. And this is a patient, again, uh, a diabetic male, smoker, has got uh, blood outflow obstruction and recurrent uh, urine tract infection. And there was uh, urine culture was positive for pseudomelae and the antibody test was, again, significantly high. So we treated, again, he was successful. So lessons learned again, a recurrent UTI in a patient with risk factors exposure. If the normal bacteriology is negative, you might need to consider meliodosis. And uh, so it's, it's there in most of the systems who are difficult or some you know uh, non-responding patients. Similarly, bone joint infections. Again, this is a patient with a uh, right shoulder joint septic arthritis, empirically treated with blue box splinter blood culture negative, and uh, then the orthopedic treatment went ahead with the aspiration and the joint aspirate was positive for pseudomelae. 
and started on intensive phase treatment. Uh, later on, the patient, strangely, patient did not respond to meropen. So there was a microbiology input, and then we looked into when if there are any other sources and patients subsequently had a distance spanning gaps as well. And then the patients uh, was uh, upgraded, was at, uh, added a cold treatment, the patient responded to the treatment. So lessons learned, consider milieu doses in, uh, you know, exposures respecters in cases with septic arthritis or osteomyelitis, this might be the offending organism. So now this, this is again, this uh, I think uh, again, uh, look at the samples that we have grown, uh, the, the, the bacteria has grown, it is nearly 35% of time it had been blood and there had been some pus in certain patients who had come with abscesses. There had been multiple positives, you know, blood cultures, pus, plus uh, pus for uh, meliodosis and sputum joint fluid, CSF urine. So the SF culture positivity, I actually did come. It's a pediatric case, uh, which uh, I thought I did not present here since uh, it's a pediatric case. So there had been a CSF uh, culture positivity as well. So the treatment would be touched by our microbiologist, Dr. Bhagya Bhavisiri. So I will just skip this, uh, just to let you know that there are two phases of treatment. And finally, the outcome of the disease. Uh, you can have a complete view as what I have shown in this most of the cases. You can have recurrences, you can have uh, fatalities as well as uh, very well shown by Professor Inama Korea. So now outcome of our patients, uh, uh, of, uh, there had been a, this is the outcome of culture positive patients and we had few, uh, you know, fatalities as well. But may, many we have treated successfully. So we'll uh, see what uh, the, some of the you know, relapses. This is a very interesting case, which actually I managed when I was at Balakitia. And oh, now this is a patient, it's a 55 year old patient with poorly controlled diabetes and with fever abdominal pain. He had returned from Malaysia and he had uh, multiple spinning abscesses and it was proven out to be blood culture and antibody positive meliodosis. And he had the uh, intensive phase treatment and discharge on eradication phase where he defaulted. After five months, he again comes with the similar symptoms and uh, there, were, there were more lesions and the patient looked more sick and again, the, everything was positive and the patient was started again on uh, uh, intensive phase and was this, this time he was actually compliant with the treatment and because of that he survived. So this is a relapse where the patient had been already compliant. So now we have had few adverse outcomes also, which is the latest one, which I will present to you. A 21-year-old patient is a misangiocapital with autoneopritis on tacrolimus and prednisolone and steroid-induced diabetes. So she's definitely immunosuppressed, coming with the left-sided pneumonia. And um, there was an abscess in the thyroid as well. So empirically, meropenem was started since the patient had hemodynamic stability. Blood culture was positive for pseudomelae and started on intensive therapy, but she didn't give us time and she also succumbed due to the severe sepsis, sepsis and she was immunosuppressed as well. And this is another fatality due to meliodosis and carabinia. So if you analyze the data that we have, I think Madam has shown some of the data and we that was a, a time when we were not much aware of meliodosis. Uh, that was a, data published in Sri Lanka in, in par with the world figures. But now if you look at our data, we have uh, 70, of, uh, 70 of culture positives and about nearly 40 of antibody positive. So we, we've had only 17 deaths. It comes to around maybe 10 to 12%. So it's going. So we actually, we have, uh, we have been successful in countries where it had been endemic in certain countries, the mortality rates had been Load. So we so this this shows that the awareness has been it has been actually improved and this is another program that we that we are doing to make people aware that we can reduce the mortality further with suspecting meliodosis in common infections. Right. So what were the causes of this mortality? Organ the organism related factors with the virulence and the, its resilience, 
Then patient related factors, most are immunosuppressed, you know, certain diseases. Some patients present very late and some patients relapse due to poor compliance. So these all could be, could contribute to mortality. Then third thing is the one that we could correct healthcare related factors, late diagnosis. So always suspect mediodosis in a clinically suspected patient with risk factors exposure. And this is one of the programs that we do to improve awareness among the medical fraternity. So ladies and gentlemen, take home message, Milieu disease can see as a great mimicker and consider in febrile illnesses of high risk groups as well as high risk exposure. Incubation period can vary from few days to few years. Send appropriate microbiology samples and start tentative therapy early. So do not delay initiating treatment. Consider mediodosis as an at an at risk patient and is poorly controlled responding to conventional antibiotics. Somebody who has been treated for tuberculosis, leptospirosis, if they're not responding, always keep in the back of the mind whether I'm dealing with uh, mediodosis. Look for distant sites of uh, metastatic abscesses in confirmed cases with ongoing fever or not responding to initial therapy. The most importantly, liaise with your microbiology team. I think that we had the overlap of microbiologists and the mediodosis that clearly shows the evidence what the role that they have played in controlling this disease. And we actually will be listening to our local microbiologists in a few minutes' time. So thank you very much uh, again for inviting me to do this talk. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, for the kind introduction. And uh, I thank the uh, Communicable Disease Committee of SLMA for inviting us in this symposium. So you have heard of a uh, lot of mediodosis, right, in the first two lectures. So my task is uh, to give an update on how to manage and how to follow up. Um, right, so this is the outline. Introduction, antibiotic treatment, follow-up, complications of follow-up, and teamwork. Uh, I'm not going into details, so you know how to, uh, what countries are endemic, and how to spread the disease. And the risk factors. So what are the goals of management? Managing the acute infection, of course, right? And secondly, you have to remove the focus of foresight if available and you have to manage the uh, control the manage or control the comorbidities if possible especially the diabetes uh, you you need to have a very good sugar control to cure the disease and you have to eradicate the organism because it can be latent it can be persisting so just because that you have treated the acute infection it doesn't go away so you need to treat a longer period that that is very important to prevent relapses and you have to attain the late onset complications. Sometimes they occur, right? They come with complications. And then there are adverse effects of the drugs because you, you treat with drugs and they can have adverse effects and the patients come with adverse effects. And then you have to ensure patient well-being. You have to ensure nutrition, good nutrition, right? And if needed, rehabilitation. So acute infection, Managing acute infection, the diagnosis is a very important uh, aspect. How to diagnose? Very easy. It's a culture. culture. Isolation of Burkhardt pseudomony from the clinical specimens is the gold standard. If you have positive culture, nobody can challenge you. That is mediatosis. Then, but there are the cases where culture is negative. Whatever you do, whatever the culture you do, it's negative. So then this serology helps us. Uh, in Kalamu faculty, Madam Inoka Korea has pioneered the facility and we send the sample to Kalamu faculty and they help us with serology. Serology may be helpful in cases of culture negative results or in the absence of clinical samples from patients with mediatosis, right? But in endemic countries, you know that we, are, we, all, we all are exposed to mud, soil and water, aren't you, right? In my, in my case, I may be positive for mediatosis antibodies, but I'm not infected right so i don't have acute infection so i don't need treatment so 
every time you have to relate the serology with the clinical picture. Just because the serology is positive, sometimes patients don't need treatment that you have to remedy. So these are the, the samples we have got, culture positive, like uh, uh, Dr. Kishan said, uh, blood pass, multiple, multiple samples can be positive sometimes in some patients, and sputum, joint rate, CSF, and urine. Uh, how to, by looking at the plate, how to uh, suspect that uh, that you have a Mercator pseudomeli in your plate, right? Uh, there are microbiologists in the audience, right? So by looking at the plate, one thing is called morphology. Second thing, the typical ABSD pattern. It's a pseudomonas species, oxidase positive, but quamsiclub sensitive, right? It's a very big zone for the quamsiclub. Usually pseudomonas are not sensitive to quamsiclub. And then it's resistant, typically resistant to gentamicin and polymyxin B and cholestin, uh, cholestin right? Where pseudomonas can be possible sensitive. So that's how you differentiate between pseudomonas and um, pseudomonas. And acute infection can come with any kind of disease, right? Most respiratory, you are, we have heard of this thing before. And treatment, could be antibiotic management or surgical and plus or minus surgical intervention. This is how we treat. We have two phases, the intensive phase and the eradication phase, right? And in the intensive phase, we treat with a carbapenem or a keptazidine plus or minus called trimoxazole plus or minus doxycycline. In severe disease, actually combined with all three. In the eradication phase, we treat with cortrimoxazole alone or in combination with doxycycline. If the patient has any contraindication, we seek alternatives. When you are treating with cortrimoxazole, we need to uh, accompany that with folic acid. I'll come to that later. So this is the plan of treatment, right? So to treat with keptazidine or meropenem or imipenem with or without cortrimoxazole for more than 14 days, always in the culture positives. But it depends, right? I, I, my next slide is uh, showing how long you should treat in each phase. And in the eradication therapy, it's about three to six months, depends on the uh, clinical presentation. According to the MERT trial in 2013, actually, cortrimoxazole alone can be given. It, it is not inferior to the combination therapy with doxycycline. So actually, now we are practicing it. We used to give cotrim and doxy together, but patients are coming with a lot of common, a lot of adverse effects. They were complaining of nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, right? They, they said that they can't tolerate the doxycycline. So now we have started treating with cotrimoxazole alone, which is actually having the same success. And then, Cortimoxazole, the fact you have to remember is that you need to give according to the body weight, not just the same therapy for everybody. It could be um, for an average person, I would give two tablets to an hourly, but for a, a bigger build person, about 60 kilos, I would give three tablets twice daily, or else 60 kilos, more than 60 kilos, uh, 60 or uh, 80, maybe average 80 kilos patient. I would give four tablets to an hour. So this is a one case. Uh, you have heard of this uh, before. The, by Dr. Uh, Kishanta uh, presented the same thing, septic arthritis patient, right? So he said about how the patient didn't respond to meropenem alone. So you can see the fever chart. And then this is the full fever chart. Initially, he was treated with glutoxacin and but fever didn't respond. And then we added meropenem, so, sorry, imipenem with the culture positivity, right? Uh, that time we were not actually 100% sure whether it was pseudomary. So we empirically we treated with imipenem, but fever again didn't respond. But see the response to cotrim. When we added cotrim of the salt, there was a prompt treatment response. So the fever subsided and it didn't come early. Same thing, uh, we heard of this one as well, multiple liver abscesses, right, a diabetic patient. 
So he was on melatonin from the beginning, but uh, fever didn't respond. Only when he added cortimoxazole, fever started responding. So actually speaking, in our setup, meropenamol kept as in alone, sometimes will not be effective. You need to add cortimoxazole. So have a low threshold to add cortimoxazole in a well responding case. So this, this slide is a bit com complex, uh, but it shows how long you should treat. Uh, uncomplicated, less complicated cases, you can treat two weeks of intensive and three months of eradication phase. Right? Mind you, three months of eradication phase. But in, in a complicated, more complicated case, like multilobal pneumonia with ICU admission, culture positive, you need to treat three weeks at least in the intensive phase, but same eradication phase of three months. But uh, uh, a case of uh, severe pneumonia or deep-seated abscess, you need to have a longer period of intensive case, maybe four weeks, and same eradication phase of three months. But in osteomyelitis, central nervous system infection, or endocarditis maybe, right? You need to have a longer intensive period. It could be six weeks or eight weeks sometimes. And the eradication phase also longer, uh, more than three months, Average six months, especially in the neurological cases and in cardiovascular cases. So, how effective this now? You may you may be thinking now it's very severe disease. Can it be completely cured? Yes, of course. See the show. The, now this is uh, this is the mushroom garden, right? Remember the case, right? Kshansa uh, presented this very nicely, and she had a TV-like picture and. Multiple abscesses. See, after one month, the uh, X ray almost cured, right? Almost the abscess is gone. And after six months, now X ray looks more towards normal. So we have done it our part, the treatment of the acute infection. Now remove the focus. If you have the focus, whatever you give the treatment, it would not be effective sometimes. How to remove the focus? This is case number four, uh, 47 year old diabetic, pneumonia with pleural effusion. So you can see the pleural, the, the effusion part in the right uh, side of the lung. And it was very thick, parulent pus coming out in the drainage. So he was, the fever never responded, right? We treated with aggressive, we treated aggressively with meropenem and high dose of cortimosisol. But only with the drainage of effusion, he started responding. And gradually, the x-rays uh, getting clearer and clearer. After three months, the x-ray was almost normal. So it can be cured with good treatment, and but you need to treat, you need to have the surgical input as well. So uh, the management of acute illness, we know that antibiotics plus surgery. And thirdly, optimization of the controllable risk factors, like example, good glycemic control and management of immunocompromised status if possible. So goals of treat management, we have covered three, right? Management of control of comorbidities. Control of comorbidities actually is the not the task of the microbiologist, it's the task of the physician. So I'm not going to talk about that, right? Uh, the fourth factor is eradication of the organism the, to prevent relapses. How now? This is this chart you saw initially uh, in the previous lecture. How many uh, died, right? We, out of 71 culture positives, we had about uh, four, 12 deaths. And we discharge 55 to follow up, right? That 55 needs a very good counseling about the compliance. They have to adhere to the treatment. If they get defaulted, then they will bounce back, right? So this is the follow up summary. From the total discharge, the culture, from the culture positives, we discharge 55 from inpatient care to follow up, right? And defaulted and relapsed, two, number two, two numbers defaulted and relapsed. 
and we could manage three patients as outpatients because the culture became positive. We knew that the culture positive after the patient was discharged. The all three were having uh, leaf peridopathy or one was having a um, uh, breast abscess and one was having a neck abscess and one was having a uh, leaf node abscess. So all three were managed as outpatients. Uh, there was no need of getting admitted. And number successfully completed the total duration of eradication phase was 50 out of 55 culture positives, and we had a 90% of success rate. The sewage positive with the relevant clinical history, but the culture negative cases, we discharged to follow up 44, and three defaulted and relapsed, including a four year old child with pneumonia. Right. So Madam Korea was describing how the children can get meliodosis. And we managed four patients and outpatients. And number successfully completed the total duration was 39. And we had a 89% of success rate. So total discharge to follow up was 99 since 2040 for the last nine years. Number successfully followed up was 89, almost 90% of success rate. We had five relapses. And deaths during follow-up. We had two deaths during follow-up. One was a relapse case. He relapsed and died. And one, one died because of the late onset malignancy. Total mortality rate out of all treated was 17%. Uh, not all, actually, from the culture, among the culture positives. From the total cases, it was 12% of mortality. The complications of the disease or unrelated during follow-up were occurring for three patients and adverse reactions of the drugs was occurring and needed readjustment in 11 cases. How the recurrences, now recurrences can be relapse or reinfection. Actually, relapses are commoner than reinfection. We had five patients, as I described, two patients with lung abscess, one patient with splenic abscess, one patient with septic other, and a seven-year-old patient with pneumonia. So relapse can be more severe and life-threatening than the first episode. Now you have heard of this case, which uh, Chancer described before, right? With splenic abscess in, in the initial, uh, in the first episode, but he came after five months, he bounced back with multiple lapses everywhere, in the, in the spleen, in the liver, in the kidneys, right? So it was very difficult for us to treat we treated aggressively and for a longer period. So always the second episode is life-threatening and more severe. So detailed counseling on the side effects of the antibiotics, uh, avoidance of risk factors and diet to restore the gut microbiome are needed. So it would improve the compliance in this long run towards the eradication. So long run towards the eradication, which is being done by the microbiology team in our clinics during all the visits. Uh, in collaboration with the other specialties. So we have done four parts, with, which is the fifth part is the again date onset complications related or unrelated, right? So this is the case number six, a uh, 59 year old diabetic, a smoker, a mason. He was diagnosed as lung absent, blood culture was positive for pseudomelic, and antibody titer was 1 in 10,240, which was very high. And treated for three weeks as an inpatient and discharged to follow up on cotrim and doxycycline. Patient complained of loss of appetite, loss of weight, and very high ESR throughout. He was defaulted. He went for a native, native, native treatment. So I'm not criticizing native treatment, but he defaulted in the Phoenix um, uh, visits. After three months, he came up. He was jaundiced. He was the there was yellowish discoloration. So we repeated the, all the investigations. Strangely, the SGOTPT was normal, but very high bilirubin, direct bilirubin was there and uh, total bilirubin. So we got the radiologist opinion, what we can do, and uh, both ultrasound and the CT evidence was hepatocellular carcinoma. When we were describing the kind of risk, the risk he's having and the, the disease, Actually, after the ask, after the first risk, after diagnosing the hepatocellular carcinoma, he again defaulted. So 
when he was not coming to the clinic, we called him at home, but nobody answered. But after three months, we learned that he passed away, unfortunately. The another case, 33-year-old uh, female, asthmatic, a new, new diagnosed asthmatic, a garment worker, diagnosed as lung abscess, we treated, but she was complete of cough and fatigability throughout. Chest X-ray strangely remained unchanged. The changes were remaining as they are. So we got the radiologist input. It was a true cut biopsy revealing mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung. So the mediatosis was on top of the, that adenocarcinoma as we imagined. So she, she was transferred to very Sarah. Actually, I couldn't follow up after that. So when the even though you have culture positivity, even though you have very high antibody treaters, when you are successfully treated, patients may be responding initially, but if the the if if at some point if they are coming with up with complications or if the response is lagging behind, you need to think of underlying other other comorbidities as well. Right. Right. Um, Mm, yes, this is a, this is this is this is related complication. A, a patient with blood culture positive pyel nephritis in the clinic visit. After the second visit, he came up with the weakness of the uh, right foot, and it was diagnosed as foot drop. Right, so foot drop is a very rare complication of mediatosis. It's a neurological um, uh, complication. So there's there's no any specific uh, treatment for that. We reassured him and we detected him for rehabilitation and the treatment, treatment was continued. So goals of management, we attended the range of onset complications and how to address the adverse effects. Now, co-trimosis hall is the mainstay of treatment during intensive phase and also in the eradication phase, but it can cause a lot of problems. One is bone marrow suppression. You can have thrombocytopenia or leukopenia and it can inhibit potassium elimination, so the patient can end up with hyperkalemia. And then you can have Stephen Johnson syndrome, rashes, toxic epidermal necrosis, and other hypersensitive reactions. Potential state of structural malformations in the first trimester if you treat pregnancy, right? And uh, the hyperbilirubinia to the baby if you give in the third trimester. And interactions with other drugs because of the potential inhibition of the cytochrome 450 enzyme. Uh, if the patient is having warfarin, you can have high INR. Or if the patient is on sulfonylurea, uh, anti uh, uh, diabetic drugs, you can have uh, hypoglycemia. Or if the patient is on ferritoin, you can have ferritoin stroke toxicity. So, adverse effects of antibody, how to avoid? One is if the patient cannot tolerate or contraindicated with cortrimoxazole or doxycycline therapy, seek an alternative. Like in pregnancy or in children, we used to give cormoxiclove instead of cortrimoxazole or doxycycline. So it's for the temporary, it may be temporary or for the entire duration. But the main thing is you need to monitor the patient. And drug holidays. Sometimes the patients come with thrombocytopenia or hyperkalemia. We give drug holidays. We temporarily withhold cortrimoxazole and we change out something else like doxycycline or pharmacyclove combination. And once the patient reverts back to the normal levels, we start again, but with close monitoring. And we, you, know, you, need, you can give folic acid supplement, which is very, very beneficial actually to come, uh, uh, reduce many of the side effects. And avoid concomitant use of potentially interacting drugs if possible, like I described. So quality of life should be improved. In clinic visits, the very the beauty of the clinic visits is actually we 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 have our microbiology clinic is very not very contested clinic. We have very few patients, so we have time to talk to the patient and we have time to listen to the patient. So you develop a very good rapport with the patient. Patients are coming with sometimes household problems as well, right? So we, we can give a good counseling about the compliance and the diet and they ask us the diet and how to bathe and how to eat and everything. So we sometimes we refer to the nutritionist for a, a good uh, nutrition, uh, uh, the well-balanced diet, right? And uh, sometimes they need rehabilitation like in transverse myelitis. 
and we, we, need, we can assess the comorbidities because every time when, when a diabetic patient visits us, we require, we uh, monitor their glycemic control. If it is not very high, if it is not controlled, we refer to the clinician, uh, physician or the uh, endocrinologist. And uh, for the uh, renal part, renal compromisation, if the patient is going up, we refer to the nephrologist. So we seek other specialties help in the follow-up. So it's ultimately a team, a good team a good team always to, uh, helping towards the successful implication phase. So the take home message is whatever the clinical presentation we handle, mediatosis is a disease. When a patient can be saved with the correct and prompt treatment, ideal management and the close follow-up. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, uh, I need to uh, actually uh, um, uh, acknowledge uh, Madam Minoka Karaya who raised awareness about mediatosis among the microbiologists even uh, back in 2012 or 20, uh, more, even before that, right? So after that only we were also getting interested and I'm very thankful to the, uh, the physicians and all the other specialties, uh, the consultants in Karapitya Hospital uh, for us uh, in, in the close collaboration and uh, helping us to follow up. Uh, so it's uh, like I said, it's a team. Thank you very much.